a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This is today, if I'm not mistaken, the 18th reading of the wonderful book Martin Luther wrote in the closing years of his life and published in 1545, which is called Against the Roman Papacy, an Institution of the Devil. This is part of a bigger work. This is, um, as you know from some pictures, Luther's works, volume 41, Church and Ministry. And only the pages from what was it here? 200 and uh, oh, where is it? 260 something um, from 263 on until the end. Deal with against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil. Before we have two other books. The first one is called uh, on the councils and the church, and the second one is called against Hans Wurst. And I'm telling you that because. Um, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update started reading the latter part, uh, the late, the latter part of the book here, the against the Roman Papacy, the Institution of the Devil, and now is busy for the moment. We have today the first of January, 2018, according to the Antichrist system calendar, uh, calendar, and um, <coughs> Tom Fress is reading for the moment on, on the Council and the Church, the first part of the book, and of course you can go to the um, uh, playlists in the description box of this video and you will find Tom Fress's reading there. And um, in that other book we see how much Roman Catholic leaven still was in that actually wonderful person of Martin Luther. But even though that he declared the Antichrist the papacy, even though that he proved that the Antichrist is uh, the Roman Catholic Papacy, even though that he made his three points, as we read on page 269, as you probably remember, um, that we, <coughs> that uh, Martin Luther, no, that's not 269, um, that Martin Luther says that there are three points that he wants to, uh, that he wants to prove to us, the, that the Papacy is the Antichrist, on the one hand, that the Papacy um, <coughs> is not uh, what we are reading right now. Um, <laughs> why don't I just find this here before part one? Uh, sometimes this this is really really crazy. Martin Luther has a lot uh, uh, made a big introduction, of course, until he came to the three points that he wants to read to us, um, and we are now in the second point. Yeah, it was not 269, it was 289, of course, where he says, I wanted to cover three things. First, whether it is true that the Pope in Rome is the head of Christendom, above councils, emperors, angels, etc., as he boasts. And second, whether it is true that no one may sentence, judge or depose him, as he bellows, and that's what we are busy with right now for a few pages still going. And then comes the third and last point that Martin Luther wants to make, that whether it is true um, that the Pope transferred the Roman Empire from the Greeks to us Germans, about which he boasts immeasurably and, boasts and, and uh, beats his breast. Um, when we read about these points, we learn how wonderful Martin Luther's understanding of Roman Catholic dogma was and how that was contrary to the Bible. That is one thing. And then you go to the beginning of the book and read on the, uh, on, on the Council and the Church, as uh, uh, Tom Fress does right now, an Inquisition update, and there you see all of a sudden so much Roman Catholic leaven in Martin Luther. Now why am I starting and telling you that? 
uh, with this reading because there's a lot of things of course that I love about this book and there are a lot of things that I love about Martin Luther but Martin Luther was not perfect as nobody is perfect and nobody ever was perfect except of course for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ but for the rest all men fail and Martin Luther also has had some Catholic leaven in his blood even until his death child baptism and a lot of things about the holidays this is what Tom is for the moment busy with when you are uh, going to the archives and on First Amendment Radio and want to listen to this part that I'm talking right here and then go from, I don't know, part 11, part 12 on of his reading and, and listen to yeah what happened actually last week, that was the last week of December um, 2017, uh, when he recorded that, that is just incredible to see the mistakes that Martin Luther still had in his understanding, even though that he perfectly understood the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church to be the synagogue of Satan and the papacy being the Antichrist of Scripture. Just want to tell you that. Also Martin Luther is not perfect. Anyway, I'm gonna pick the book reading up today and uh, we still have a few pages to go. Probably too much of course to read in one time because you know I'm a slow reader. <laughs> we have 13 pages left. But um, I want to continue with a repetition of the paragraph of, of the second paragraph on page 363, which I told you last time was actually the paragraph that made me have interest in having this book, and then Brother Brad Norman uh, gladly sent it to me. So I'm going to continue now, and so you know where to pick it up when you're going to read along in your own copy of the book, and um, let's see where the reading takes us today. This first few sentences, this first paragraph that I read to you now, has had that much impact on me, Jörg, that I wanted to have this book and read this book. And here the Pope is judged and called a liar, even by his own theologians, for calling us heretics. And they do not... Ex uh, and <laughs> I'm sorry. And here the Pope is judged and called a liar, even by his own theologians, for calling us heretics, which they do not accept. Just as he was condemned and called a liar by his own lawyers, that he did not have the keys from Matthew 16, because they were solely promised and not given therein. Thus, it is quite certain that no one can judge or punish him. I would not dream of judging or punishing him either, except to say that he was born from the behind of the devil. He is full of devils, he is full of lies, blasphemy and idolatry. He is the instigator of these things. God's enemy, antichrist, desolator of Christendom, church robber, key thief, brother keeper, steward of Sodom. And everything else that was said above. But this is not a verdict, judgment or condemnation, rather these are sheer eulogies, eulogies and pledges, so that no one is to be praised and honored except the most satanic, the Pope. It would be a good thing if he had to carry them engraved and branded on his crown and forehead. That would fit his satanity much more honorably, because it is the simple and clear truth than his letting, than his, letting his feet be kissed. And if the Pope had done nothing but set himself above all the churches and bishops to be judge of all and let himself be judged or punished by no one, and thus give and allow the devil and flesh free reign to practice all the mischief as we see and as Jude says in his epistle, quote, they are ungodly persons who pervert the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Unquote, from Jude 4. This one thing alone would be sufficient token by which one could recognize the Pope that he certainly must be the true, the final horror, the Antichrist. Interesting sentence, huh? This one thing alone, meaning they are ungodly persons who pervert the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ from Jude 4, 
This thing alone would be sufficient token by which one could recognize the Pope that he certainly must be the true final horror, the Antichrist. The final horror, because after the coming of the Antichrist, there is no horror anymore. When the, ho when the Antichrist is done, when the Antichrist is taken away, then Jesus Christ comes back and then finally there will be peace on the earth. Figure out for yourself. The Holy Christian Church has the Holy Spirit and the Gospel or God's Word, as no one can deny, so that it should teach the good and punish the evil, which it does and has always done according to Christ's Word. Quote, the Holy Spirit will come and reprove the world of sin, unquote, as we can read, among others, in John 16, verse 8. The Pope would like to sit in judgment over this word and remain unpunished by the Holy Spirit. That means sitting in judgment over God, whose word it is, as St. Paul says, he who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship. Again, the wonderful, important reading of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, in this case, verse 4. Now, one cannot serve God better than with this world, over which the Pope sits in judgment and against which he rages, as all his decretals roar and rage. What more does the Lord himself say to this? He says in Matthew 18, verses 15 through 18, quote, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault, between you and him alone. <laughs> Does Jesus Christ here say, go to a Roman Catholic priest and confess your sins? No. He says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him, tell him his fault between you and him alone. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you. As we can also read in the Law and the Prophets, amongst two or three witnesses, everything must be accomplished. Yeah? If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth, etc., etc. What shall develop from this? Here the Lord throws all those who sin into punishment by first his nearest Christians and wills, in short, that he should let himself be punished. If he refuses to let himself be punished, the congregation should punish him. If he refuses to listen to them too, now mark what the Lord says, then we are to consider him a Gentile and a tax collector. Not only all the churches or every single church is commanded here, but also you and I, Martin Luther, and I, Jörg, to judge, to sentence and condemn the Pope with a verdict of being publicly condemned by the Church's throne of judgment, a Gentile and a tax collector. Now I hear already a lot of people screaming, Yeah, but you should not judge. See that you won't be judged. You have to understand that in the right sense. When you judge by the word of God, you will be judged with the word of God. Okay? And I don't want any judgment, I want grace. That's why I am under grace. But it is my job to judge people like the Pope, to judge the Antichrist. It is even said by, him, uh, by, by, by Jesus Christ himself. And then, if he still does not uh, listen, then we are to consider him a Gentile and a tax collector. So we are not speaking about then uh, we still should see him as a brother in Christ. Yeah, the teaching is we are all brothers in Christ or brothers and sisters in Christ, but not the ones that we make out as a Gentile and a tax collector because he sinned against us, he sinned against, against the church, he sinned against Jesus Christ, he sinned against God, and then we have to... Uh, we have to treat him as a Gentile and a tax collector. And that is exactly what we have to do with 
the Pope and with the whole Roman Catholic hierarchy and with everybody who does not live according to the word of God. He will not listen, Martin Luther continues, and won't let himself be punished either by one or two or by the congregation, indeed not by the whole of Christendom. As he rages and many decrees and decretals, he even wants to be praised for such things, to uh, he'd be told, well done, and to force Christians to obey, praise and worship such a horror as divine truth. The Pope wants his error to be obeyed, praised and worshipped as a divine truth. What Martin Luther says here, in other words. There is no need here for a trial or a long lawsuit, an objection or an appeal. All that is notorious according to fact and law. The deeds of the Pope are obvious. The mandate of our Lord Jesus Christ is obvious. Ah, oh, be silent, lawyers, theologians, emperors, kings, yes, even angels in heaven and all creatures. Here speaks and judges one who did not suck woman's milk, but virgin's milk, and was so poor on the cross he had nowhere to lay his head, and yet in that very place gave paradise and the kingdom of heaven to the thief, and in the manger was worshipped by all the angels in heaven. Yes, it is this same Lord who here judges and speaks, quote, The Pope shall be a heathen because he will not listen, but even claims this obstinate disobedience of his as a great holiness, unquote. He commanded the apostles in the same manner to punish the whole world because of the idolatry which was openly there, and not first to go to court with the idolatrous heathen, Otherwise, they would never get to the preaching office. Thus, I, Martin Luther, accept the verdict of the Holy Christian Church, yes, of the Lord Jesus Christ, and proclaim it with this document, that, as I have often done already, to all who do not know or have not understood that the Pope, yes, the papacy itself, who will not and cannot listen, has been damned by God and thrown out of his church because of his decretals, his, those sheer pagan, heathenish, sinful things, that is. He is of the devil and of an unchristian realm, before which everyone should bless himself, flee, and against which everyone should pray and act. That, to me, again, is a very important important point Martin Luther makes here. I accept the verdict of the Holy Christian Church, of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and proclaim with this book that I am writing here, as I have often done already, to all who do not know or have, uh, have not understood that the Pope, the papacy itself, who will and cannot listen, has been damned by God himself and thrown out of his church of the Church of God because of his decretals, those sheer pagan heathenish sinful things. That is, he, the Pope, is of the devil and of an unchristian realm, before which everyone should bless himself, flee, and against which everyone should pray and act. The prayer of a righteous man availeth much, the Bible says, and it is our work to do so. And again I come to one of my uh, most loved sentences in the New Testament that I've learned a few weeks ago, or yeah, a few weeks ago when I uh, was uh, having my Bible study with Brett Norman and Tom Fress, and we were reading through uh, Ephesians, and in Ephesians it says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Now, follow seven points that explain who or what the whole armor of God actually is. Okay? I will skip that and I will directly turn to the seventh point. Ephesians 6 verse 18. 
praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Prayer is one of the weapons that we should take on as we put on the whole armor of God that we have our weapons ready when we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against the principalities and powers against the rulers of darkness of this world. Prayer is one of the weapons. So, do you see the connection where Martin Luther tells us here, where I have left uh, left, up, uh, left off in the book, uh, before which everyone should bless himself, flee from the Pope, and against which everyone should pray and act. That prayer is most important to do. The prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The Bible says. Of course by that the Antichrist will not all of a sudden vanish, but we have to pray for the things that we long to. We have to pray for the things that we long to God should fulfill for us. And taking away the power or diminish the power of the Antichrist, or even better, to make known to everyone who the Antichrist is, should be our foremost prayer content. We want to warn the people. We don't want to see them trapping into holes, trapping into, I don't know how, how, you go, how you're going to say that, into, into deep abysses, fall into the road of perdition. We want to warn our fellow brethren of the danger that the Antichrist is, that the teaching of the Antichrist is, that the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, the synagogue of Satan is, we have to warn these people. And there's also a part of that warning that Martin Luther says here, that should be prayer. We pray for it. We cannot reach everybody. I can reach only the few people who watch this video, okay? With this work at least, okay? So, I pray for that these people who are watching this video, who are listening to my voice here, reading this book of Martin Luther against the Roman papacy, an institution of the devil, understand it, and I pray that so many more people wake up to that fact, that so many more people wake up to the fact that the papacy is, always was and always will be until Jesus Christ returns, the Antichrist of Scripture the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist. Prayer, therefore, is needed. And the more we pray, the more people we can even wake up. Why? Because prayer is a spiritual weapon and it is the spirit that works. We cannot convince people with material means that the papacy is the Antichrist, but we can spiritually bring them on the right path. Therefore, prayer is very important. Now Martin Luther continues here on the bottom of page 365. If we now know this verdict, we really are not doing well, especially emperors and kings, princes and lords, for the preachers and bishops of the church will surely handle themselves correctly in this, so that they will embellish, praise and decorate the Pope as a devil. To so ignominiously, ignominiously, sorry, to so ignominiously allow him to rummage in their mouths, drum on their snouts and make monkeys of them, when they, if they claim to be Christian, should rightfully acknowledge their duty to handle this accursed pagan in Rome like he deserves to be handled. They make themselves a party to all the sins the heathenish devil in Rome has practiced in the church for so many centuries and to all the books, decretals, sextae, clementinae, extravagantes, bulls, that is, to all the devil's filth and stench 
with which Christendom has been suffocated and strangled. I, Martin Luther, am certain that if the Pope did not exist, the Turk, or Islam, as we call it today, whose devil is the cousin, brother-in-law and sister of the Pope's devil, would not have received such great power. A very important sentence of Martin Luther, right here. I'm going to read this last sentence again, that you will understand it, please. And by the way, this is of course how I will title the video. I am certain, Martin Luther says, that if the Pope did not exist, the Turk or Islam would not have received such great power. Now, what power of the Turk, or in modern terms Islam, is Martin Luther here talking about? Martin Luther wrote this in 1545, and in the years about 1520, the Turk was standing before the doors of Vienna. Islam was invading Europe. Anybody has a bell that is ringing about the Islam invasion that we have today in 2017, 2018, 2016 already it started, 2015 probably it started already, with the Muslim migration. Yeah? with all this quote-unquote refugees that all of a sudden come into Europe. This is just another tactic, but it's still the same enemy. And therefore you have to understand that Martin Luther says here that without the Pope, the Turk would not have received such great power. What does Martin Luther say here to us? Islam is controlled by the papacy. This is what Martin Luther already tells us in the 16th century. We don't need Alberto Rivera to reveal that to us in the end of the 20th century as he did, because Alberto Rivera was given access to the Vatican archives by Cardinal Bie, the German who was leading the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, and by that study that he did, he learned that the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church, founded Islam, and uh, but Alberto Rivera brought that out. But Martin Luther does the same thing, only not in so many words. But why in the world would Martin Luther say that without the Pope, the Turk would not have received such great power? How is that possible if he doesn't see that they too are connected? How would that be possible if Martin Luther would not have le at least have the suspicion, if not even the knowledge, that the Roman Catholic Church controls the Turk, controls Islam? Islam was the early arm, the early military arm of the Roman Catholic Church. Until in 1540, just a few years before Martin Luther writes this book, the Order of the Jesuits was founded, another military arm of the Roman Catholic Church. Now a man has two arms, one on the right and one on the left. The Roman Catholic Church has two military arms. The Jesuits on the one side, Islam on the other. Now all he needs to do is take these two arms and fold them together in front of him and embrace the whole world and squeeze the arms with the whole world in between to him and suck out the life of the Protestants by using these two weapons, these two military arms the Jesuit order on the one side and Islam on the other. And by their working together behind the scenes, the common enemy of both will be destroyed. And who is the common enemy of Islam? Every quote-unquote infidel, meaning unbeliever of Allah, that means every Bible-believing Christian, that means every Jew, and I don't know how much they care for all the others, and especially also for the Roman Catholics, 
but there I already made the arguments of the quote-unquote liberal Roman Catholics who are even enemies for the Roman Catholic Church itself. Aren't those the same enemies of the Roman Catholic Church itself? Aren't those the same enemies of the Pope himself? Do you think what... Do you, do, you, do you see what happens here? Do you see how Martin Luther all of a sudden opens us the eyes, opens our eyes and says, I am certain that if the Pope did not exist, the Turk would not have received such great power. That is a wonderful and so true a statement that Martin Luther makes here. Now, since the Pope is not a Christian, <laughs> why? why, Jörg, the Roman Catholic Church calls itself a Christian Church? Well, the Roman Catholic Church is as much Christian as white is black. Yeah? Since the Pope is not a Christian and is not called such, but rather has been thrown out of the church through the verdict and command of Jesus Christ, an accursed heathen should be neither judge nor lord in the church of Christ, much less such a bedeviled man of sin and child of perdition. All the emperors, all the kings and bishops are duty-bound to take back their sworn oaths and duties which the Pope too, even if he were a bishop in Rome, would have neither the right nor the power to demand, and act against them with all their might. Yes, Martin Luther tells us here about a perfect world. A perfect world in which everyone would see that the Pope is not Christian in the first place. A perfect world in which the politicians... Which, is, which are called here by Martin Luther the emperors and kings, and also the bishops, meaning the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, are duty-bound to take back their sworn oaths and duties, because they all swear oaths to the Roman Catholic Church, to the Pope, and they should all take back their oaths, because they are working against Jesus Christ. And the problem, of course, in our society today is that all the politicians, every king, every emperor, every prime minister, every president of a country, is on the dark side of the power and not on the white side, the light side of the power. Huh? Martin Luther makes the point here that because the Pope is not a Christian, every king and emperor or president or prime minister, as you can say in modern words, every bishop and every cardinal are duty-bound to take back their sworn oaths and duties and act against them with all their might. Because the Pope is not a Christian. Point. Point blank. A bishop of the church cannot accept either oaths of allegiance or duties from alien, free, worldly lords, nor from another bishop. It's all bishops and churches are equal, according to the teaching of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, unless he had some temporal subjects of his own. The Pope has less right and power to do so. He who cannot be and never was a Christian or a bishop but rather is the devil's fruit, an accursed, a damned alien rule, which is nothing but the ruin and devastation of Christendom. No one can swear an oath against God, and if he does, it is the same as doing it to the devil himself, which one should, when it is recognized, tear up immediately, as the lawyers say, themselves say, and act to oppose it out of the power of the first and second commandments. Thou shalt have no other God, and thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. Thus 
emperors, kings and bishops are rid of the oaths they made to the Pope and because of this they are duty bound to oppose the Pope in all his works. For such an oath is made to the devil as though the sheep had sworn allegiance to the wolf in the name of their pious shepherd. No, I have a nice picture. I don't know if I think of. No, I, I don't think that I can build this in because for the moment I have troubles producing my videos and I have to switch over to my laptop to make this video. But I have a nice picture in there of a few sheep who are going to the wolf and saying, "How come that we poor sheep are going to confess to the uh, to the wolf?" Yeah, that is a picture that would be right fitting here as though the sheep had sworn allegiance to the wolf in the name of their pious shepherd. <laughs> this last part of the paragraph here is so powerful that Martin Luther writes, and I'm going to read it once again, no one can swear an oath against God. And if he does, it is the same thing as doing it to the devil himself. When you are swearing against God himself, you are swearing for Satan, against God and for Satan, which one should, when it is recognized, tear up immediately, as the lawyers themselves say, and act to oppose it out of the power of the first and second commandments. Thou shalt have no other God, and thou shalt have, thou shalt not take the, norm, Lord, the name of the Lord in vain. Thus, emperors, kings, and bishops are rid of the oath they made to the Pope, and because of this, they are duty-bound to oppose the Pope in all his works, for such an oath is made to the devil, as though the sheep had sworn allegiance to the wolf in the name of their pious shepherd. In other words, as though the sheep had sworn allegiance to Satan in the name of Jesus Christ. This exactly is what the people do when they adhere to the Roman Catholic Church. They swear allegiance to Satan in the name of Jesus Christ. And here the lawyers should, for the Pope claims to be a lawyer and teacher of all lawyers, play action for damages. Yeah. Another legal term by which Luther means the Pope should be sued with him. For he is neither a bishop nor a Christian, speaking of the Pope, but a pagan, yes, a savage werewolf who tears up and devastates everything in his way and has snatched for himself the keys of churches which were really never entrusted to him but only promised to St. Peter as the words in Matthew 16, verse 18 clearly say, and which the lawyers understand, quote, in terms of the future, unquote. But we theologians add to this. Even if the keys had been promised to St. Peter, even if the keys had been promised to St. Peter and also given to him, there is still no proof at all that only the Roman Church could have such keys because St. Peter founded other churches besides the Roman Church. If he didn't found the Roman Church at all, which is not certain and can never be proven. Yes, there is no record in the Bible or anywhere else that is traceable that St. Peter was ever in Rome. And on the danger of repeating myself, I tell you, the only Simon Peter that ever was in Rome and founded the church was Simon the Magus, Simon Magi, which you can read about in Acts, I think, chapter 8, if I'm not mistaken. Look it up for yourself. Simon Magus, the Sadducee, the, uh, coming from, um, what's it called there? Samaria. Yeah. Again, this is a 
two important sentences to leave it butchered within the comment and I have to repeat the sentence to you again. We theologians add to this, even if the keys had been promised to St. Peter and also given to him, there is still no proof that only the Roman Church could have such keys because St. Peter founded other churches besides the Roman Church and if he did found the Roman Church at all is not certain and can never be proved to which the keys of St. Peter the Apostle should be, have been given just as well as to the Roman Church. But the Pope since there were no more bishops in Rome, stole and robbed these keys before St. Peter even gave them, and attempted to act as though they were his exclusively, even though he has forced himself into the church like a foreign animal and werewolf, and as damned by Christ as was her. So now the lawyers should admonish their lords, emperors, kings, bishops, princes and lords of their duty if they want to be Christians and saved and not stop until they have forced the accursed Pope into restitution to turn and restore all that he has with the, sto with his key with the keys stolen, robbed and done in the church from the beginning of the papacy. It is certainly true that the Pope's keys are, quote, a sacrilege and unspeakable despoilment, unquote, a church robbery which has never been equaled since the beginning of the world, even if all the church robberies were placed in one pile. Here the Emperor should take Rome, Urbino, Bologna and everything the Pope stole from the Empire for it was all stolen and robbed through the falsified keys. After this, he should force him to restore all the souls he has let into hell through the keys, although this will be impossible for him, and restitution must be made in eternal hell fire. But we could probably take the finite goods away from him and add it to what this key thief and church robber has used, has used up, dissipated, spent, hauled up, and squandered out of the gods, out of the goods he had stolen for so many years. If he could not repay or restore those things, one could play the uh, the law of the fox with him. All the cardinals and the whole curia, that is pull off their skin over their heads and thus teach them to pay with their skin, then throw their rumps into the springs of Ostia or into the fire. See, see how my blood boils, how gladly I would see the papacy punished, even though my spirit knows that no finite punishment is enough for this, even for one bull or decretal. But anyway, this is the summary. The poor Roman Church and all the churches under the Pope can neither be advised nor helped unless the papacy and its rule, including its decretals, are removed and a proper bishop again instituted in Rome, who would preach the gospel purely, who would uh, preach the gospel purely and properly, or see that it was preached and would leave crowns and kingdoms in peace which are not entrusted to his rule and not try to subject them to himself by oaths. Who would be one bishop equal to other bishops, not their lord? And who would not tear their churches apart, rob them of their goods, trap them with oaths or increase their burden with pallia, anates and papal months? One can surely be bishop in Rome and in the whole world, even if one does not sell the pallium, steal anates and commit other extortions, trample on kings and let one's feet be kissed. St. Peter was an apostle, in my opinion, as good as a bishop and without a doubt better than a pope, yet he would not allow the centurion Cornelius to fall down before him 
but raised him up and said, Stand up, I too am a man, as we can read in Acts chapter 10, verse 26. And he gladly let himself be corrected and punished by St. Paul and by the apostles of, and all the disciples in Acts 11, verse 3. Because I have the pallium in mind, I must tell you the story of what, of what it accomplished. This squabble that has arisen between me and the Pope arose over the pallium. A pallium is made of hemp or flax, knitted and worked in the shape of a cross, which one can throw over the back and front of a chasuble, as the crosses and chasubles usually are. It is about the width of three, of three fingers, and should be worth, all in all, about six or seven lion pennies. Yeah, this is uh, 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 Löwenpfennig, that is a small silver coin, showing the Thuringian Meissen lion, part of the coat of arms of the Wetten lion. So that was the um, currency of that day. Or one sword penny, uh, Schwertgroschen, as it was called in German, a silver coin used in electoral Saxony, and Luther comes from, comes from Saxony, the part of Germany, showing the swords of the electoral marshal. So, he says, the pallium should not be worth more than seven lion pennies or one sword penny. This is how costly it is. This is what the Pope blesses on the altar in Rome, and then lies that it was consecrated over the bodies of St. Peter and St. Paul, for they have the bodies of neither St. Peter nor St. Paul. Then he sells it to the bishops, charging one more than one another, depending on the size and wealth of the bishoprics. In former times the popes bestowed it without cost and ordered it to be given at no cost, as the decretals still say. They were satisfied to thus gain lordship and power over other bishops. But later, like desperate scoundrels, they added compulsory oaths of allegiance and money to receiving the pallium. Now it is said that the pallium in Mainz cost 26,000 gallen. This is how expensive hemp thread is in Rome. Some say that one could not bring it from Rome for less than 30,000 gallen. This bishop, speaking of Albrecht of Mainz, uh, yeah, could not pay for such an expensive pallium, so that he let some pickpockets go out with indulgences to raise money from the people. They were so obvious about it, that it was too much, so I forced to preach and write against it. Uh, against indulgences, you remember? 95 Theses. Thus the game started over a hemp thread, and no one knows the end of the game yet. <laughs> Martin Luther's early account of the beginning of the game in this volume, and you can read pages 231 through 236. You can go back there to have a deeper understanding of what I just read. May it come to the Pope's being strangled and suffocated by that same threat. May my dear Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of us all, praised in eternity, help in this. Amen. Yes, I say one can certainly be a bishop without the pallium. And it is not necessary to let the arch-robber of churches, the robber of monasteries, convent devourer and murderer of souls in Rome steal so much money in plain sight and repay us with the devil's filth and stench, sheer lies, blasphemies, idolatry and eternal damnation. We Germans intend to invest this money in other ways so that the Pope may not steal it from us so shamefully. This, then, is a brief statement concerning the second point, whether no one or someone can judge, sentence and depose the Pope. And it has been found beyond a doubt that not only the churches, but every baptized Christian may judge, condemn and at least depose him from his heart, as an antichrist and werewolf, as the enemy of God, of Christ, of all Christians, and of all the world, and who 
whoever wants to be a true Christian and wants to attain salvation should judge and teach, sing and say that whoever wishes to obey the Pope should know that he is obedient to the devil in opposition to God and help strengthen the Pope in his horror. As Second John verse 11 says, quote, For he who greets him shares his wicked work, unquote. Besides, the Lord himself, in Matthew 18, verse 17, has openly judged him and thrown him out of the church and the company of Christians. He should not be called a Christian, as was heard, because he wants to be unjudged and unpunished, that is, be a free devil and werewolf, therefore he must be damned publicly by God and all the creatures. Yes, indeed. God's Son should have died and shed his precious blood so that a despotic scoundrel in Rome could boast in the name of all the devils that he had been freed from, through Christ's blood and death and that thereby received the power to sin, received the power to rant, to rage and to do whatever he wished. Against this no Christian, not even the Holy Spirit in his church, has anything to say or judge as uh, in um, in this uh, 40 C. Papa teaches us even uh, even though St. Paul in uh, Galatians 1 verse 8 uh, delegates to Christians the power to judge and condemn even an angel of heaven if he should preach another gospel. That's what the Pope does, brethren. The Pope teaches another gospel because the Pope doesn't even know the Bible. He does not teach the Bible. What did the disciples say? What did Paul say? If anybody comes to you and teaches another gospel than the one that you've heard through us, I curse him. Huh? But what are the Pope, cardinals and all the devils together compared to a heavenly angel? Except that the Pope thus not only has to reveal his blasphemy, accursed lies and idolatry, but also must show his grossest his gross ass's head to all the world as one who does not understand at all what a Christian, what a church, what God's word, the spirit or God himself is. If he understood, it would surely know, it, uh, sorry, if he understood, uh, if he understood it, he would surely know that God's word is the highest judge over all creatures and he who possesses it in true faith is called, as we can read in 1 Corinthians 2.15, the spiritual man, who can judge all things, yet can be judged by no man, not because of his own person, but because of the word and spirit dwelling in him, and speaking and judging through him, as St. Paul says, in the same place. But we have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2.16 That is why with Pope and Cardinals it is nothing but crude Roman insanity. Insanity, yeah. Thus the Pope brings about his own downfall, judges, condemns and ousts himself from the Christian Church exactly because he doesn't want to be judged and makes himself a pagan and goes on, as the Lord says, quote, I will condemn you out of your own mouth, in Luke 19.22. For because you don't want to be punished like all other Christians, Matthew 18.17, you are certainly not a Christian. If you are not a Christian, then you must certainly be, in the name of all the devils, Antichrist or Pope among the Christians. Yes, this is how the Pope wanted it. This is what he was striving for. Whoever wants to be a Christian should and must consider the Pope the devil's spirit, invention and property, before whom one should flee, against whom one should pray, Ephesians 6.18, and against whom one should in all earnestness live and act, as against the devil himself. 
What does Martin Luther say here in different words? He says that the papacy is nothing but the mask of the devil in this material world, in this fleshly world. That's what Martin Luther says, in other words. The Pope claims to be the vicar of Christ. He is the vicar of Satan. He is the placeholder of Satan. He is the one who lets Satan into the church. And it is our job to expose him and to throw him out. He has nothing to do with the body of Christ. Yes, this is how the Pope wanted it. This is what he was striving for. Whoever wants to be a Christian should and must consider the Pope the devil's spirit. He should and must consider the Pope's inventions and property before whom one should flee, against whom one should pray and against whom one should in all earnestness life and act as against the devil himself. The Pope is the devil himself, hidden under a mask. That's what Martin Luther says here, in other words. He has entrenched himself so securely with his decretals that no one could do him as much harm as he does to himself, since he wishes to base and defend himself upon the very best, just as he toppled himself above with the two passages about building on the rock. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, and about feeding the sheep, as we can read in John Ultimo, verse 15 upon which he had based himself, so that no writing against him could have toppled him as well. This has been said about the second point, this time briefly. Martin Luther here ends the second of the three points that we were speaking about, on, that I explained to you on page 289, where Martin Luther said that he wants to address with this book or to cover three points. First, whether it's true that the Pope in Rome is the head of Christendom. Second, that it is true that no one may judge him or depose of him as he bellows. And third, that it, whether it is true that he has transferred the Roman Empire from the Greeks to us Germans. This is point number three and the final point of the book Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil, written by Martin Luther and published in 1545, that we will cover in the next reading, on page 371, we still have about uh, five pages to go to 376, and I will see whether that is going to be one reading or two readings, we will see, it doesn't matter how long it's going to take, important is that you get the message, that you understand as Martin Luther teaches here in the very last paragraph on page 371 before part 3 of the book starts, I'm going to repeat it once again, that you can really well, very well let it sink in and understand it. Martin Luther says, Thus the Pope brings out his own downfall. Judges, condemns and ousts himself from the Christian Church, exactly because he doesn't want to be judged, and makes himself a pagan, and goes on as the Lord says, I will condemn you out of your own mouth. For because you don't want to be punished like all the other Christians, you are certainly not a Christian. If you are not a Christian, then you must certainly be, in the name of all the devils, Antichrist or Pope among the Christians. Yes, this is how the Pope wanted it. This is what he was striving for. Whoever wants to be a Christian should and must consider the Pope the devil spirit, invention and property before whom one should flee, against whom one should pray, uh, remember Ephesians 6 verse 18, which I read to you, and against whom one should in all earnestness live and act as against the devil himself. The Pope has entrenched himself so securely with his decretals that no one could do him as much harm as he does to himself, since he wishes to base and defend himself upon every best, uh, uh, upon the very best, just as he toppled himself above with the two passages 
about building on the rock and about feeding the sheep, upon which he had based himself so that no writing against him could have toppled him as well. This has been said about the second point, this time briefly. Martin Luther says this time briefly because he plans of writing another book, but uh, God did not grant him a longer life that he could write another book. But we are going into that in the very last sentences of this book in a few pages in the next reading, probably. Up to here, Jörg from Jogla 66, Hour of the Truth. I thank you very much for watching, for listening, discussing this. And um, like I said, this is only Martin Luther declaring the Pope being the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist. There are many others, and don't forget, all the reformers win a court on this one point. The papacy is the Antichrist. The Roman papacy is an institution of the devil. All reformers were in agreement on this. They were in agreement on the basis of the word, the word of God, Jesus Christ who tells us who the enemy of all mankind is. The Antichrist, the Pope of Rome. Until next time, thanks for watching and listening. God bless you and bye-bye. <laughs>
है